Welcome, everyone. My name is Hilary Robertson, and I am the co-chair of the MEFM Society of BC. It is my pleasure to introduce to you the first in the Society series of education presentations. We gratefully acknowledge funding of this series from the Wickerson Foundation. Without their generous support, these would not be possible. Our first speaker in our series is Dr. Louis Nakul, the Medical and Research Director at the Complex Chronic Disease Program at BC Women's Hospital. Dr. Nakul has been a researcher for 30 years and involved in myalgic encephalomyelitis research for over 20 years. Dr. Nakul has been leading the way in facilitating new and existing research at the CCDP. And since he started in this position, he has been part of three successful grants and officially took over as principal investigator for the CCDP data registry, a five-year longitudinal longitudinal data registry for patients referred to the program. We look forward to hearing updates of his research projects and of other significant Canadian research in the following presentation. Welcome, Dr. McCool. Good, uh, thank you very much for the invitation and for this opportunity to present uh, about uh, our research at CCDP. The Complex Chronic Diseases Program is a clinical program. It is the provincial clinical referral services for people with complex chronic diseases, including MECFS, fibromyalgia, and chronic, chronic Lyme like disease. The program has a research arm, and the, RCC, the CCDP research is done uh, in collaboration with the Women's Health Research Institute, also at the BC Women's Hospital and Health Center. Our research priorities include the evaluation of clinical services. We want to know how well our clinical services at CCDP are doing and other services elsewhere, and what we can do to improve. The epidemiology of ME in Canada, how many we are, how many people are affected by any CFS in Canada, who they are in terms of sex, gender, age, and other factors. What are the needs of people with ME and other complex chronic diseases? And on a, a more ambitious level, what are the risk factors or causes of ME, CFS, and other chronic diseases? What are the biomarkers and treatments? for any and their subgroups, including, for example, long COVID, which in some cases, or some cases of long COVID, will actually present as ME. This is a screenshot of our research team, or most people are there. We have Kiana Miguel and Melody Tsai, who are our research assistants. We have Travis Bolter, our research coordinator, Carola Munoz, our research manager. We have another uh, temporary research assistant and our clinical trial coordinators as well, which we're not shown show in this slide. So let me tell you about uh, our five largest projects that we have at CCDP. First, I'll speak about the CCDP data registry, which he has already referred to, which has been funded by the BC CDC Foundation. The data registry involves uh, patients from CCDP who agree to do research or consent to research. And uh, the I can see, I mean, uh, secondly, the I can see, I mean, network is the first Canadian wide network of researchers, clinicians, and patients with any. Then I'll speak about the neuroinflammation in ME and post-COVID fatigue syndrome project that we do in partnership with colleagues of the Image, Image Tech Lab in Surrey. Clinical trial of low-dose naltrexone for post-COVID fatigue syndrome, which is funded by the CIHR. And uh, we are doing in partnership with the post-COVID recovery clinics in the province. And finally, I'll speak about other research 
in the area of long COVID. Starting with the data registry as an example of clinical and health services research, we have recruited 700 participants so far whose mean age is 49 and a half years. Just over 80% are women, 80% are white, nearly a quarter of them are working either full-time or part-time. This 25% uh, figure is comparable of uh, what we found in the UK and eBioBank, where about the same uh, percentage of people are actually uh, in work. And about a third of the patients or participants in this uh, data registry are on disability. I'll just present uh, some uh, results uh, which are preliminary and uh, show uh, in this slide that the fatigue severity score, which is an uh, indication of severity of fatigue, came down from baseline when the patients entered the program to six months into the program and discharge. So in this indicator, the lower the better. So there was a trend towards improvement throughout the program. This indicator comes from another instrument, which is the SF36 or RUN36, and it's, uh, the interpretation is the other way around. So the higher the, high, the higher the levels of energy or the better the health status. So we can see a significant improvement in statistical terms of the energy levels throughout the program. The same instrument, the SF36, allow us to get a summary score for physical health, which can significantly improve during the program, and mental health score, which also improved during the program. This slide shows uh, the results of the PHQ-9, which has been used to uh, identify and to measure uh, depressive symptoms. And uh, the GA7, or Generalized Anxiety Disorder 7, refers to anxiety symptoms. And what we also uh, observe here is improvement in both those indicators during the program. It's very important that ME is actually a neurological disease. It's a biological disease, not a mental health illness. However, enduring a long-term illness uh, which promotes a lot of disability and which uh, is difficult to treat, has an uh, impact on individuals. And it's natural that there will be an uh, emotional impact on individuals affected. And that's why it's important also to measure those outcomes that we are having here, because one of the components of the program is uh, uh, to provide uh, support for people in different ways, and not least, uh, uh, in emotional health support. Of course, there are lots of other things which are more focused than that, that we do like uh, medical treatment uh, with pharmaceuticals when appropriate and also other uh, recommendations and other um, empower, uh, other, other activities to empower the, 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 the people who are part of the program in terms of better pacing, better management of the energies etc. So let me move to the ICANN CME network, which is the unique network of uh, ME CFS in the country. Uh, this network is about improving research, knowledge transfer, and education on ME CFS. We here at BC lead on one of the three pillars of the project, which is Pillar two, which is about developing the research infrastructure for any research. So this research infrastructure uh, includes the development of database, the integration is, and the standardization of databases throughout the country, which includes the establishment of a core data set based on common data elements. This means that we want people doing research or clinical, uh, uh, clinical practice in different parts of the country actually use some data collection 
instruments which are the same throughout so they can be comparable. The database structure uh, is being developed with support from RTI in North Carolina in the United States, which is one uh, center of excellence funded by the NIH there. So they are giving us support for two cohorts or databases for two cohorts, which you call the clinical cohort, including the complex chronic diseases program patients, patients from the environmental health clinic in Ontario and from the integrated chronic care service in Nova Scotia. These are the three referral centers for the treatment of ME in the country. The other cohort is the population cohort, and with that we partner on CANPATH, which is a Canadian Partnership for Tomorrow Health, which contains a, or includes a cohort of over 300,000 people across Canada that are followed up longitudinal, i.e. they are followed up uh, through time. And we, in particular, we started working with the PC Generations Project, which is the largest project in British Columbia, larger uh, uh, health ever held. And it has about 30,000 participants from the province. So by partnering with them, we were able to examine among those 30,000, how many have ME-CFS and contact them. And this is what we uh, were able to establish uh, initially that the prevalence of ME in BC based on this cohort is 0.18%. We call it minimal prevalence because this is based on a sample uh, from the population. And we know that ME is underdiagnosed largely. So there will certainly be people around uh, in the population who don't uh, ha who haven't thought about ME, but maybe they are ill with other diagnosis rather than a correct diagnosis of ME. Interestingly, in our uh, study in the UK, our popular study in primary care in the UK a few years ago, we found a minimal prevalence of 0.2%, which is very similar to the one we found here. And again, in that study, we were referring to a minimal prevalence because of the potential underdiagnosis of ME-CFS. This would mean uh, around 10,000 people in BC with ME. If we think about international estimates for the prevalence of ME, which are about 0.4% rather than 0.2%, we're about double than that, then we were talking about around uh, 20,000 people in the province with ME. These are very rough estimates, but the fact that we had access to the BC Generations Project cohort of 30,000 people, uh, we were able to identify those people who uh, had ME, although uh, we may have missed some cases there because of the way the data was collected. The mean scores for uh, ME patients compared to controls for SF36 and PQ12 were significantly worse in patients as we would expect. When you think about working or people at work, when you look at people at ME, about 21% were working full-time or part-time compared to controls, uh, who, among whom about 73% were working. This, this uh, figure of uh, between 20 and 25 is again consistent with what we found at the data registry and data in UK, although slightly lower. And it may reflect, it's slightly lower, it may reflect the fact that these are people who were captured at the population rather than a clinic or general practice levels. I just mentioned that the, the, our objective is to look further than we see into Canada, pending further funding. So we consider the uh, BC cohort as a pilot for the national cohort. And we established the national ME registry is feasible. It's feasible to do at national level. And of course, we uh, established and confirmed that the health and quality of life indicators 
uh, in ME are uh, very low compared to non-ME cases and controls. As part of the ICANN CME project, as I mentioned, we want to establish some standards, or some parameters that are accepted and used across the country for both research and clinical practice. So for example, when you think about diagnosis of ME-CFS, particularly for our databases, the database will capture diagnosis according to the IOM criteria 2015, the Canadian criteria, and the new NICE criteria. So we would like all studies to be able to use instruments and use methodologies that will capture these criteria of diagnosis. And of course, if people are also interested in fibromyalgia of those who have considerable widespread pain, we'd encourage people to use the fibromyalgia criteria uh, from 2016. When you go to pain, we, rec we are recommending, and this has been an extensive work with, uh, uh, with an expert uh, group, uh, we recommend the pain uh, visual analog scale and the pain score from the SF36. So you know that uh, those instruments are quite simple and easy to use. And if we want to ask people across the country to use some instruments, we want to have them uh, to be rather easy to use. But of course, people may opt at individual research studies and individual clinics to go beyond that according to their preferences and needs. And so we also indicate some supplementary uh, instruments which are listed here and of course every clinic every research study will have the discretion to select other instruments and in terms of physical and lab, lab measures we are recommending the NASA uh, lean test or the standing test for 10 minutes weight and height hand grip strength, which we found to be a good indicator of severity of ME, as well as serum concentrations on CK, which is the creatinine kinase, creatine kinase, which is um, also has been shown to be uh, altered in people with severe ME. Let me move to our research on neuroinflammation in ME. There has been some evidence uh, including for post-COVID cases of neuroinflammation or a, 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 an inflammatory process or changes in the immune system in the brain, which could explain some or many of the symptoms and abnormalities in ME and COVID uh, in, in the chronic stage. So with Dr. Song, uh, an imaging specialist from uh, Image Tech, we want to investigate brain metabolic temperature anatomical functional changing uh, using MRI, MRI data. So this is about different parameters which are seen on MRI that can indicate uh, inflammatory processes. And for that, it's a small study with 20 women and five controls that we are recruiting. We plan to start next month. That's the, 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 the uh, timeline that we have now after uh, the closure of the lab for extensive periods of time during the pandemic. In addition to that, uh, 50 patients with post-COVID will be uh, also follow the same protocol and have the MRI taken at, uh, at the same place as part of another study, which is that as a clinical trial on low-dose naltrexone for post-COVID fatigue syndrome. This clinical trial uses a drug naltrexone in low doses, uh, which has some evidence uh, of effectiveness in, in, in fibromyalgia and MECFS. And it's a drug that in low doses has an effect, seems to have an effect in improving inflammation in the brain. And that's the rationale in, in a nutshell for trying this drug of people who have post-COVID fatigue syndrome. In other words, this means who have long COVID, but that presents with MECFS. And this will be a double-blind placebo-controlled trial where you use daily doses of naltrexone in increasing uh, uh, 
increasing uh, from from one to five point five milligrams per day. So you have increasing doses, and the treatment is given for sixteen weeks. Uh, all participants will be from the post COVID recovery clinics in BC, and the study will involve one hundred and sixty cases who have COVID or. Uh, in the previous three to six months. And as I just mentioned, 50 of those patients will have brain scans at the beginning of the study and then after treatment. This is just a schematic representation of the trial, what people are randomized, 80 to receive treatment, 80 to receive placebo. We have 25 of placebo and control group doing the MRI. And then we start giving increasing doses of the pharmaceutical product. And we have assessments of those patients at 6, 12, and 16 weeks. We have the opportunity also to look at uh, fatigue-related outcomes or ME-related outcomes in other studies in post-COVID. This one is... Uh, from the BC post-COVID respiratory cohort. This is, uh, the, as far as I know, the first cohort of patients with COVID uh, that were treated in hospital by our colleagues from uh, respiratory medicine here in BC. And this was in the beginning of the epidemic. The mean age of the individuals was 61 years, 45% were white, 40% Asian, and 29% didn't have any other diseases at the time of admission. They were pretty healthy, with between 20 and 22% having one, two, or three plus comorbidities or other diseases, including, for example, lung disease, cardiac disease, diabetes, etc. 47% were admitted to intensive care and 19% needed mechanic ventilation. What was found in this study is that fatigue, just the symptom fatigue, was pretty common at three and six months. And these range from, uh, from 50, 57, 58 to nearly 70%. So there was a declining the declining fatigue. So fatigue is an extremely common symptom in post-COVID. However, we also look at what we're calling here substantial fatigue. Substantial fatigue is the type of fatigue that the ME people have. It's a fatigue that is there all the, uh, most of the time. It's, it's really debilitating in the, the way that people cannot do their activities. And it, it, it went from just over 20% at three months to 16% at six months. So this severe form of fatigue is still pretty uh, common post-COVID, at least in this cohort of people who had COVID and were hospitalized. We did the same thing for uh, concentration problems, which are between 20 and 30%. But when you look at substantial concentration problems or the type of concentration problems that any people have, or people with any have, this, this uh, was around 10% uh, between three and six months. So if you think about uh, ME, and we unfortunately couldn't uh, make a diagnosis of ME because we relied on data that had already been collected, and it was not specific for an ME study, you can see that uh, substantial concentration problems and fatigue are uh, key requisites for someone to be diagnosed. And if you look at the lower end, like concentration is a bit less common than fatigue, then we, we can interpret this as, as being the maximum prevalence of ME following COVID. At three and six months has been around 10%, which is quite significant still. But of course, many people will have other symptoms, other debilitating symptoms, but will not be in uh, the ME itself. So we try, we look in this cohort to what are the causes of predictors of fatigue in three and six months. And we found that uh, uh, age was uh, one of those factors, I mean, the p-values represent the, the statistical significance, and I just highlighted those who are statistically significant. So when the odds ratio is under one, it means that lower age, or age is a protective factor 
in a way, which means in other words that younger age is associated with a higher risk of fatigue. And then number of comorbidities, the odds ratio is 2.21, meaning that people who have more illness when they got COVID actually as are, were at a higher risk of developing fatigue. Remember that fatigue is just one of the symptoms. Uh, is, this is not exactly the same by all means. It's not the same as any, but it's, it's what we could do. It what was available with that data and already provide quite useful information. Uh, however, when you look at um, uh, severity of COVID, like uh, 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 ICU admission, this was not significantly related to people having fatigue after COVID. And also, although there was a slight uh, excess of women in this score to develop post-COVID or actually with fatigue, uh, this was not statistically different from the number of men. All right, so another study we were able to uh, participate in is what a, a, the COVID home study, and this is a study conducted in the Netherlands, including uh, people who were not hospitalized during the COVID. So this is the other extreme of uh, or other, other uh, layer of severity. Those are the known severe cases, and I'll just show some of the results. Uh, concentrated or first on fatigue related symptoms, persistent fatigue, you know, it's very common. This is three, six, and 12 months. We're talking about 40, 50%. Uh, severe fatigue, so that's the same fatigue that we're talking about between 20 and 30%. So not very different, maybe a bit higher than, than actually the other study. And then, but in this study, because we were used, we were able to use our protocols as well in the study to look at ME. We look at things like post-exertional worsening of symptoms. So we're talking about 15%. We, we, work, uh, we look at post-exertional malaise between 10 and 20%. And uh, pain, uh, post-exertional pain about 10%. So we were able to look at more, uh, more symptoms uh, that might relate to, to ME CFS. And uh, one thing that is interesting is like uh, lightheadedness that can, can be a sign of autonomic uh, dysfunction, for example. We look at that about 20% palpitations or dizziness and fainting while standing up. All this is something that we call uh, are related to postural hypertension or, or POTS. And all these uh, were in the region of 10 to 20%. When you look at neurological symptoms, uh, many of them had trouble concentration. Sleep problems were quite common. This is a key, uh, a, a key, a key question uh, or key symptom in ME. Memory problems, difficulty in finding same words, brain fog. Uh, we're talking about uh, about twenty percent reporting brain fog. Loss of problems of balance. Uh, difficulty understanding or retaining information. So we haven't uh, yet uh, in this study looked at uh, trying to look at how many actually completed diagnoses of ME, the analysis are ongoing, but just by looking at this data, I wouldn't be surprised that if we end up having uh, something along the lines of 10% having a uh, fulfilling diagnosis of ME uh, uh, months after having COVID. I would like to thank our collaborators who, who are uh, seen in this slide, uh, both at the provincial level, national level, particularly I can see CMU network and, and, and many clinics and, and other projects at national level. Uh, the international level, uh, we have, um, I mentioned a study from Holland, but, uh, and also I mentioned uh, studies from the UK, but we also have collaborators in other parts of the world, world and especially the ME uh, patient community, not least the ME FM Society of BC, uh, with whom we have uh, been partner, partnering for some time, including doing research together. And of course, this is our research team. We also need to acknowledge uh, primarily, of course, the uh, patients with ME who contribute to research, who are part of research, and we are most grateful for them. Uh, this helps us to understand a little bit more uh, better uh, uh, the, the disease and how uh, we can better control it. <clears throat> 
And of course, our research team, uh, I already showed the picture of some, those are, they are listed here. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Nicole. This has been an excellent insight to the research underway. At this stage, we would like to have a few questions from the community and uh, get your thoughts on, on uh, your answers on that. So thank you very much. So the first um, community question for Dr. Nicole is, how can patients in BC be a part of the CCDP registry and or the National Data Bank? Thank you for this question. Every CCDP patient is offered the opportunity to be part of the data register. When they arrive at CCDP for the first time, they are given information about the data registry and they have the opportunity to consent or not to be part of it. Of course, non-consenting doesn't affect in any way their clinical treatment. So uh, in addition to that, those identifying as having any in the BC Generations project, all of them will be offered uh, uh, the opportunity to be part of the National Data Bank. So it, how it happens, uh, we, we uh, identify those who are already part of the disease registry, data registry, who have confirmed ME, and we will eventually, when we set up the National Data Bank, ask them to be part. And the same happens with those uh, case identified in the Generations Project. We hope to be able to expand our sources of patients in the future. Thank you. Great. Uh, our second question, how do patients find out about participating in other research? Right, the uh, research participation opportunities uh, will be advertised in, in uh, including, for example, in our website and where appropriate in the MEFM website. At the moment, our research involves patients who currently are or have been clients of CCDP or either the BC Generations Project Court or the, uh, the post-COVID recovery clinics. Uh, Court. So, at, uh, so far, research has mainly target people who are specifically already part of clin uh, a clinic or a board, but in the future, uh, and, and some of our research is already expanding between the, uh, these sites, and of course, we're going to be advertising them widely. Thank you. Um, community question number three, why isn't there any VC or Canadian clinical trials on ME? Well, that's a very good question. That's something we would like to do more and more because uh, treatments uh, for ME is something that we're still lacking, though, specific treatments. Um, clinical trials are expensive. They require a lot of expertise. They require, they require funding. And historically, unfortunately, there's been very little funding for ME research, not only in Canada, but across the globe. It seems the situation has started to change, although there's lots of uh, improvement that still need to happen in, in terms of funding. However, as I mentioned, uh, we are about to start a clinical trial with patients with ME-CFS developed following COVID-19, our clinical trial. So this will be, uh, I think, uh, actually the first clinical uh, patient initiate or uh, pa uh, with patient partnership, of course, but uh, it's one of the few clinical trials or probably the first clinical trial in BC uh, in the field of uh, COVID-19 or post-COVID-19, I, I should say. And uh, any. Number four, how do patients or our local doctors learn about the outcomes of CCDP research? Yes, we are very keen as our research come out, and, and I remember today I presented some results, which are still preliminary, but I think we'll have full results uh, for, from more and more studies uh, relatively soon. Uh, some results from the data registry and the cohort study in BC Generations project have been presented at the International Association for Chronic Fatigue ME conference, both this year and in previous year. Uh, we are planning to publish uh, results of these studies in medical journals, 
and uh, to continue presenting results in conferences and in events such as uh, this one with the patient community and other educational events uh, with doctors. Other ways to find out uh, future results will be through the CCDP new letter, newsletters. It's something that we are um, planning. It's something that already has exists, but we are planning to, to uh, increase the frequency of uh, uh, news, uh, production of newsletters and also on our website. We, and we're also planning to increase the space for research uh, on the website. Thanks very much for the questions. I hope they help to clarify the answers that came from uh, the community. Thank you so much, Dr. Nicole. The MEFM Society and our community would like to thank you for your time today and your entire CCDP research team staff for your ongoing work in ME research in BC. This has been uh, very, very encouraging and we appreciate you taking the time today. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me.